Tanisha, how he was going to next door. Yeah, it was so good. He's amazing. Yeah, he's not from there. Yeah. And he's <laughs> and really good. Yeah. He's really good. He's really cool. Yeah. Look, okay. Is it on? Okay. Thank you everyone for coming to the second of our maths talks, new this year. Um, in this one, Joe is going to be speaking about useful and interesting maths, so I hope you will enjoy. Yep, so, hi, I'm going to be talking about um, the ways in which we would find maths out in the everyday world and how that can sometimes be surprising or useful and how um, you can't always take it for granted. So, um, I'm going to start by... Um, so, this is the Vasa. It's um, a Swedish warship from the 17th century. And a bit like the Mary Rose, um, what's special about it is that it capsized on its maiden voyage, um, having sailed just over a kilometre out of the harbour. So, um, as a result of this, um, it was preserved under the water, and this is now the actual ship in the museum in Stockholm. Um, very impressively reconstructed. Um, well, not reconstructed, this is the actual timber, the actual wood. Um, but the interesting thing is about why we think it sank, and sort of why that might not happen nowadays. So, in 1626-ish, when this was being built, their sort of shipbuilders didn't do calculations in the same way that um, shipbuilders now would um, do calculations before building a ship. So, they built ships based on um, the ships they built before, and it was something of an art, it was kind of after you had some experience, you knew what kind of shape um, a ship would be to stay up, which sort of makes sense. You kind of intuitively know that something that looks about like that is probably going to float quite well. Um, so, it was built for King Gustav II Adolf of Sweden, and he wanted a really impressive flagship, so he wanted it to have lots of gun decks, so this has particularly two gun decks. And the result of this is that it's quite unstable, so there's not enough of the ship under the water. Um, so when the wind hit the sails, what happened was um, the ship tilted over because it was too unstable in the water. Um, interestingly, they kind of knew this before they set out. <laughs> um, so what happened was, um, as a demonstration of the stability or otherwise of the ship, before it set out, uh, the captain had 30 men running across the deck from side to side um, to, what, to see how stable it was. And once they'd done this three times, it was kind of ready to capsize. Um, so it wasn't, I suppose, entirely unexpected. <laughs> But the point is that um, sort of nowadays you couldn't imagine this happening. You do um, simulations beforehand. Uh, you could do a central mass calculation to work out that the central mass would be too high up. You need more ballast. So it's not um, uh, shipbuilding hasn't always done that kind of calculation. Um, and mostly that was fine. Most ships didn't sink, but. Um, sometimes it can be useful. So, in comparison, um, we have much more modern ship building, which, as I've mentioned, does use much more mathematics. So, particularly last year, the America's Cup was held, which is um, a kind of national sailing race. One country holds the America's Cup and another country challenges for it. And it kind of incorporates the uh, most cutting edge boat design of our time. So, for example, this is one of the boats. It's a catamaran, so it has two hulls. 
Um, it does look very much like conventional sailing boat. And the sail is actually an aerofoil. So what happens is it's effectively a vertical wing. So you get um, if this is your wing, it's approximately like that. Um, and what happens is you get air currents coming this way. And the way that they flow over the aerofoil creates lift upwards. So this is like in the plane wing, so the object is to keep the plane in the air. Um, what happens is that the air flows faster over the top than it does through the bottom. So the pressure um, underneath is greater than the pressure on top. Does this make any sense? Mm -hmm. um, so you end up with a net force upwards. And that's what happens with these sails, but they're vertical, so they need a force in the direction of the um, There's also, um, so these navier Stokes equations are another example of the mathematics that's used. Um, they're um, very complicated, but they link the, uh, about how fluids move. So, Fluids. Modeling fluid movement is very complicated because you have turbulence, which is really hard to model. Mm -hmm. uh, but sort of these link the pressure, the speed, the viscosity, so kind of how fast it flows, um, and things like this, to get something that you can at least try and use to understand a bit more about how the boat is moving through, through water. So. Um, how you build ships nowadays as opposed to in the 17th century. <laughs> okay. My kind of second example of um, interesting maths is uh, involves the use of conic sections. So Conic sections are an idea that the Greeks thought a lot about. Uh, they're the different shapes you get by slicing through. This is a double cone, so basically you put a cone on the top. And if you slice through vertically, you get a circle. Um, if you go a bit more diagonally, you get an ellipse. Um, as you can see, you have a parabola, or also this thing called a hyperbola. Um, so this has a current use, and it's about how you, um, if you find something you're trying to track. So say you have, um, someone's got a radio transmitter, and you're trying to find them, and you have radio transmitters and receivers, but um, you can't communicate with them in any way apart from sort of sending out radio, radio signals and getting signals back. Um, you can use this, for example, um, in things like if you're trying to track some property, or if you've got a VIP and you don't, and you don't want to lose them. <laughs> <laughs> so you give them a radio transmitter. Um, <laughs> and basically the way it works is you have your target, which is your VIP, <laughs> and you have, do you have to pass? Um, We have some people around, and we know approximately where they are, and say they're like this. So the question is, what can you do to find them? You all have radio transmitters, but how can you actually find them? So one thing you could do is, I could send a signal to my radio transmitter, and that tells them to send a signal back. So they send one back, and I know how much time <coughs> there is between me sending the signal and me getting one back. 
um, and using that I can work out what distance I must be away from them. So this is where you get point exceptions coming into play, because one way of defining a circle is the this is the locus of points, so all the points that are a certain distance away from the centre. Um, this is useful here because all I know is the distance between them. So I know that my target must lie on a circle of this radius. Mm -hmm. I know that they're somewhere on this circle. <laughs> and that's a very bad circle. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know there's somewhere on this, I suppose it's a. Um, so, what can I do to work out precisely where, where they are? I can use someone else and do the same thing. Um, so, they send a signal. Something like that. And I now have another distance, so I can get another circle. <laughs> um, goes a bit more up here and around here like that. Um, you notice I now know they're at one of two points because they have to be where the circles meet. So they're either here or there. Um, and you can see that with the third person I can draw another circle using the same technique and that will definitely put them there. So I've used three people, but I now know definitely where my target is and I can go and find them. The disadvantage with this is that um, I have to s use six radio signals, so there's one there and one back for each person, and I have to do that all at the same time, because otherwise they might have moved. Um, so there's sort of you can do this in alternative ways using other connect sections. I have my target. And I still need three people. Instead of sending a signal and then receiving the signal back, I can actually send a signal and tell it to send it to the other tell tell my target to send the return signal to the other two people. So I send the signal. And my target sends a signal. Yeah. And I can measure the time so I know the distance. And what I actually know is the total of these distances. Again, this is useful because you can now talk about ellipses. So, an ellipse is um, draw an ellipse, an ellipse is possible like that. And an ellipse has two foci. And the characteristic of an ellipse is that if I pick any point here, the sum of these distances is, is, is always the same. So that's the situation I've got here because I know the sum of those distances. Um, so I can, again, I know that I now, my target is now somewhere on this thing. Any guesses as to what I might do next? Yeah. Do you want to go to the Yeah. So I can do the same thing, um, still sending from this person, but now um, the signal goes back to this third person. And that gives me another edge because I now know these distances. Um, these two are my focusing in my kind of central point of the ellipse. And I now have an ellipse that will look like a cross. 
intersection point so I definitely know where my person is. This is a little bit better because I only actually need um, the two or three transmissions, so one from here and then one each back. And I only need one person to be able to send radio signals into people just have to be able to receive me. So this is getting better. Um, so, what I'd really like to do is find my person without me having to send out any signals. Um, so I have my person, my target, maybe. I have three points. I have my three people I'm using to find my target. And now I just say, my target is sending out a radio signal every few minutes, say. And my people are going to receive that radio signal. So, target sends out a radio signal, and it's received by this person and this person. Okay. Um, these people can talk to each other, so they know if this person receives the signal first, then I can time how the diff, sort of how long between this person receiving the signal and this person receiving the signal. Um, so I know the difference in the distance, the width of this distance and that distance. Um, there is another conic section that helps you make use of this. So I'm now looking at the hyperbola, which is yellow over there. And a hyperbola has you have two points. And how you define a hyperbola is that the difference, if I have a point here, then this distance minus this distance is always the same. So, in fact, this will look approximately like that. And you can sort of see that however far I go up here, this distance is always going to be slightly shorter than that distance. So, that's what I'm using. Um, so, my heart, my heart, the same as before. Let's go. It's really like that. And in fact, I can do the same thing for this person and this person, for example. Uh, so I get. And then finally you can see you can do the same person for that person and that person. And you get a third hyperbola going through this point. So this is especially useful because you don't have to send anything. You just have to wait for your target to transmit something and then stand there and receive it. And it kind of comes from conic sections which are thousands of years old but which turn out to be really useful when doing some quite modern problems um, in the real world.
talking about modelling sort of is a very big section of mathematical use in the real world and it's probably what you think of when someone says maths used in the real world. Um, it's used in all sorts of situations. You have engineering design um, is now done a lot of, on a lot of computer computers for simulation. You get something called finite element analysis, which is where you have if you want to work out how a bridge is going to react, if there's some wind, then you say, I'm going to divide up my bridge into lots of little chunks. And I'm going to see how each of those chunks reacts at a certain time, depending on what the other chunks around it are doing. And that can use quite a lot of computing power, but you can get some really useful and accurate models. So that's finite element analysis. And that kind of helps you guys. Um, nice. You also have models to predict the future. So if you're talking about models in the financial markets, um, that's used to see what would happen, say, in a worst case scenario. Um, would my bank be able to survive in a worst case scenario? Um, so you can run models as to what you think would happen and see if the bank's capable of it has enough money to survive that. Um, yeah. you know, weather forecasting is kind of infamous for using um, lots of models, possibly occasionally not being accurate. Um, but the reason it's very difficult to weather forecast is basically because the weather is really, really complicated and um, it's really hard to take into account everything that might affect the weather. Um, that's particularly true because you get something called uh, chaos theory, which is a relatively young area of mathematics. And what it says is that even if you have some quite simple rules for um, what's happening, you can still get really different outcomes. So, um, for the weather forecasting, there's even a really slight change in air pressure somewhere could potentially cause a storm somewhere else. And that's kind of become known as the butterfly effect, because by flapping its wings cause a small change in air pressure and then you can get the storm somewhere else a few weeks later that might not otherwise have happened. Um, that's weather forecasting. A lot of these models work on the basis of assigning a few simple rules and then running it lots and lots of times and seeing what's happening. Um, an example of this is the Game of Life, which was um, sort of presented in 1970 by a mathematician, John Conway. It's got simple rules, but you get some nice patterns from it. So, it's played on a grid. Some of your squares are filled with counters. So, say I have this one. And there are some rules for what's going to happen to the counters. So, if my counter has zero or one neighbours, so if it's kind of on its own, or if it's only got one neighbour, then in the next generation it's going to disappear. If it's got two or three neighbours, it will stay where it is. If it's got three or four neighbours, and that can be any of 
these squares, then it will also disappear. So it kind of like, it disappears if it's lonely, and it disappears if it's got too many things around it, and it can say if it's got just the right number of things around it. Also, the way you get new counters, Um, is if an empty square has three neighbours, exactly three neighbours, then it will have a counter in, in the next generation. So we can kind of run this with a really simple one of three in a row. And you get this one disappears because it's got no names. If we look at the empty cells first, so this one's got three names. So next generation, there will be a captain. Um, also this one has got three names. Um, this one right now has two neighbours. So it's this line. This one only has one neighbour. So. And this one also has one neighbour. So next generation, I get something that looks like this. Um, and if you think about well, what's, what do you think is going to happen with the generation after this? Yeah, absolutely. Because um, this is just the original configuration but turned 390 degrees. So next generation, it's just going to go back to how it was. So this is a very simple example of the game of life demonstrating periodic behaviour. Um, and it just cycles between two states. But the game of life could also become very complex and do lots of other things. So if you have the right configuration, nothing will happen. Sort of all the squares will survive to the next generation, but you won't get any more. So that's called a still life. <laughs> um, and you can have things that go on forever and keep on going. Um, this works very well on a computer because you could get your computer to run to run the game in mind lots and lots of times. So if you have a look at It can be an ellipse if you prefer. Let's try that. See what <laughs> it's clearly a circle. <laughs> so we can do it by steps and see topologically. Um, and see what's happening in each generation. Or we can run it. Um, so is that Did you have a purpose? That was exciting. Um, so is this possibly actually what we have there, but just repeated a few times? So you can see those little islands that are going through those cycles. It existed, but now no longer does. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and the green is just to show kind of where where it's been. Thank you. 
they are still following rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or occasionally something shoots up and mm, sort of bursts into something. So we expect all to eventually settle. Mm. It's going back. Mm -hmm. The number of my cells is, seems settled around 900. Some of these have lovely names, like Inkles by Boat, and I think you can call some of these egg rock carrots for myself. Um, certainly some of them have good names. And so if you just search Conway's Game of Life, you can get some of these. In terms of Going back to models again, um, so one example of where this is used is in London Underground. Uh, London Underground wants to know how crowded the tube is and particularly which stations might be crowded and what they can do about it. Um, so there's a team at London Underground who are kind of dedicated to modelling the stations. Um, They use both static modelling, which tends to be simpler and sort of looks at one particular place and what's happening. And there's dynamic modelling, which is, um, they kind of look at how people move around the station. Um, so their dynamic model is something called agent-based modelling, which is where each sort of person in this case has a set of rules and sort of makes decisions about where they're going to go next based on rules like not bumping into other people or taking the quickest but also the least crowded route through the station. Um, so they do a lot of this stuff. I was hoping to have a video of one of their models but it hasn't quite come through so um, I hope that will come through at some point. In terms of static modelling, um, I did a week of work experience on the world around, and they gave me a little project on static modelling. So it's on what it is is um, they wanted to look at how crowded their escalators were becoming, kind of specific part of the station. So the static modelling is less complicated. Um, but what you can do is you have a lot of data from uh, how passengers are moving through the underground. So you can ask people sort of what their journey is, um, and I don't know, sort of maybe where they change and things like that. So you can work out what routes people are using through the station. So you can work out um, how many people you think are going to be using 
particular escalator during the morning rush hour. Um, and you can get that kind of detailed um, statistics, detailed data. So, um, and then there's the, uh, these spreadsheets. This is sort of a summary of the escalators on the other. Um, <laughs> these boxes are different stations. So, for example, Z Bond Street, Salter Circus, Tom Court Road. Um, it's kind of a tube map, so you can see the central line running through here. You've got Houston, Baker Street, there, Westminster, there. Um, and these numbers correspond to the escalators at different stations and how crowded we think they are per morning rush hour, uh, based on a reasonably conservative estimate of the number of people in the escalator. Uh, so. You can see that mostly they're fine and there are, there are a couple that are, might be slightly crowded. Um, so for example, this one is a down escalator at Houston. It's people going south into the city, so it kind of makes sense that it's crowded in the mornings. Um, and the real use of this is working out what might happen in three years' time. So we can increase all the passenger numbers by 3%, which is approximately a year. By clicking your the button. Um, and you can see that some things are getting more crowded. Um, so if we sort of go five years into the future, you can see that suddenly some central line is looking like it might be crowded. Um, and this is a kind of real life use of uh, what you can do with modelling. Um, so, things like, it's not exactly why it's happening, but you can see why upgrades to the tube might be a good idea. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> you can predict that in the future some stations will get crowded um, using the maths of, well, I know that if in a really busy 15 minutes in the morning, this many people are using the station, I can actually tell you that it will be crowded. Um, and I can tell you that it will be more crowded in three years' time. And sort of by how much it will be crowded. So, um, but you can only do that if you actually, first of all, you have to have the data, and secondly, you have to have the maths to exploit the data. Um, so, Um, things like there's well there is an upgrade program on the tube at the moment. Things like Bond Street is currently closed. Um, partly because it's getting a whole new cross bus station. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see how it's modern maths can be, um, and it provides a really nice contrast to our last talk, which is on the Weebly as well, if anyone wants to watch it, uh, which was more about the historical bits of maths, so it shows how diverse and how great maths is, and how everyone should take it. <laughs> so thank you again, Joe. So, have any questions? If Joe doesn't mind. <laughs> the last example, was it uh, hyperbola? I was just looking at them. Is there any danger that very occasionally the three could meet somewhere the other side of the world in the same point? <laughs> <laughs> or is it impossible? Uh, this is a good question. I don't actually know. Um, it would be... Let's go to the other one, please. I think they could do. It would still be useful for this because even if they need to meet the 
Can you explain why a fat nerve goes wrong? <laughs> When you increased the number of people in London by 15%, how come the number of people using each escalator didn't just go up by 15%? It should have done. I think some of them are more undercapacity than others, so some of them, even if you do increase it by 15%, it's still going to be fine. So you're not modelling it in a way where you're, if it goes up 3%, some stations go up more than others due to some overall study of usage on tube, or if some, an overall increase in the population has a differential increase according to the station? Um, no, but if you had enough data on that, then you could certainly refine your model to... So, for example, when they open up all the new crossrail stations, yes. there'll be a, a refinement of your yes. model there where it, you, you press the increase and it all just goes into the central one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, so that was my work experience. So, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. which are next to each other, go across the aerofoil, they meet up again at the other end. They don't. It's, <laughs> it's not true. That's not why. I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry. Don't be angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this kind of common explanation of why an aerofoil works goes, um, goes, you have air particles, and the common explanation goes, this is longer, this part is longer, and this one's shorter. So clearly this one must be going faster um, in order to meet up at the end. And if this one's going faster, then there must be lower pressure up here. In actual fact, they don't meet up at the end. What actually happens is that this moves even faster. So in fact, when this one's here, this one may only be here. Um, so it's not simply because of the path difference, because, as you said, there's no reason why they air particles know they have to meet back up at the end. <laughs> um, it does still work. Um, and there are some simulations where you've sort of got smoke going over an aerofoil, and you can see that. Um, you can see this going faster, but the effect is actually more extreme. So it's <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Still some history stuff, everyone. <laughs>